Hello, my name is Simon Dennis, and today I'm going to be talking about modelling memory for wear. This is work that's been conducted at the University of Melbourne in collaboration with Hyung Wook Yim, Kevin Chabahang, Elizabeth Laliberte, Adelaide McKenzie, and Ben Stone. So one of the primary methods that governments have been using in order to combat the COVID-19 uh, pandemic is contact tracing. And so when a contact tracer interviews someone who has tested positive, they uh, will be given a sheet something like this. So um, they will go through the various different uh, dates and times, and the person will be asked to retrieve um, where they were at that um, particular time. And so the question um, the, of interest is how do they actually achieve that and what um, affects their ability to do it? So to test this or to investigate this kind of um, memory, we conducted two experiments. So in the first experiment, we collected data for a month and we collected accelerometry uh, vectors 10 times a second and then GPS coordinates and audio um, every 10 minutes. Um, the audio segments were three second segments. Um, so they were designed to not reveal conversations. Um, we also conducted a second experiment. Um, this one we collected only for two weeks, but in addition to the um, passive data that we collected in the first experiment, we also um, had people uh, rate the degree to which they are experiencing 11 discrete emotions eight times a day. So that way we had information about whether they were angry, anxious, bored, and so forth. About after a week of retention interval, they um, received a set of uh, trials. And in each of these trials, they were given a time. So in this case, it was Thursday morning, 8 a.m. on August 15. And they were given four um, possible locations that they are at. All of the locations were ones that they had visited at some stage. And they had to choose um, which of those four locations. Um, they were right about 67% uh, percent of the time. Now to model this, what we did is we imagined that the memory system is constructed from a large number of nodes representing different aspects of the experiences that, um, that people had. So we included nodes for accelerometry, audio and GPS clusters. Um, we also had nodes for the hours of the day, the days of the week and the weeks. And then we had nodes um, representing each of the um, 11 discrete emotions. Um, for each individual, we took um, each hour segment over their data collection um, and we looked at uh, which of those nodes, so which hour of the day it was, which audio cluster it was, um, whether they uh, were feeling angry, weren't feeling angry and so forth. And we created a, um, a record of that. And then we connected those nodes based on um, when they were seen together. And we'll talk about that more shortly. Now to represent an individual trial, what we did is we took the time, so in this case, 3 p.m. Monday, week 35, we activated those nodes, and then we propagated activation through the network of connections until it got to the um, nodes representing the locations. So the um, green nodes here are the queues, the blue nodes are the um, four location nodes that um, the participant had to choose from on this particular trial. The red nodes are everything else and all of the nodes are, are shaded according to um, how they active they were um, at the end of, of propagation. Now, the most natural way to think about propagating activation through a network like this is to start with the Q, which we're gonna call X zero, and to um, multiply by the um, weight matrix, normalize, and then repeat until you um, uh, are no longer changing. Now, if you do that procedure, that's called the power iteration. And if you do that procedure, it's known that you will find the primary eigenvector of the matrix. And that's regardless of what cues you put in. So that's not very useful from a memory perspective because obviously different cues, we'd like to come up with different responses. Um, that's been known for a long time and um, uh, Hopfield and Anderson developed um, various different models that introduced nonlinearities into the system in order to um, allow for different stable states. 
um, rather than introduce nonlinearities, what we're going to do is we're going to um, assume that there's a temporary change to the weight structure, um, which involves adding the outer product of the Q vector with itself to, temporarily to the weight matrix. And so by doing that, what we do is we change what the primary um, eigen uh, vector of the system is. And um, so now the, it will be different on each trial. Um, so just a little bit of the math around that. So we have the um, X infinity, which was the, um, the primary eigen vector of the system. Um, when multiplied by the, weight, the original weight matrix plus this outer product, um, we'll give the, um, the primary eigenvector uh, of the system multiplied by its primary um, eigenvalue. We can express that original weight matrix in terms of its eigenvectors uh, and values. And so this is this here, so the lambda i, um, and these are the eigenvectors uh, of that original weight matrix. And just substituting that into that, we can see that the final eigenvector that we um, end up, primary eigenvector we end up with our, with our system um, is a consequence of the eigenvectors of the original weight matrix um, scaled, and this, this value here is a, dot, is a um, cosine uh, between the, that eigenvector and each of the um, eigenvectors uh, of, the, of the original system, plus the eigenvector times the, um, the Q uh, vector. So there's a kind of balance that occurs between um, the similarity of the, of the thing that you end up with to all of the eigenvectors of the um, original matrix, and then the similarity of that to the, um, to the Q that you put in. And so what you want is for both of these components to, to have a influence on the um, on the final result. You want all of the eigenvectors to um, potentially have a influence on the result and you want the Q to also have a um, influence on the result. So there needs to be a balance um, between uh, these two things. Now, when we're constructing the weight matrix, one of the things we need to keep in mind is that the um, number of times you see each of the different uh, features can dramatic uh, dramatic, be dramatically different based on the feature. So here what I've done is I've taken all of the features and I've um, shown their, their frequency for a given subject um, and then rank ordered them by frequency. So things like um, how many, when you're at home, there's obviously many, many examples of that particular GPS cluster. And so it's seen very often, um, whereas you know, random places that you might have gone to the shops, something like that are seen much less frequently. So it has this kind of roughly Zipfian distribution. Now, so if you go through and you construct the weight matrix such that you um, simply add up the number of times two Qs appear together, um, if you look at the, the eigenspectrum of the, of the matrix that gets created, you see it's highly skewed. So the um, primary eigenvector is, is, um, has a much larger eigenvalue than um, the rest of them. And that's a problem for us because that means that the system is going to be dominated um, by that primary eigenvector. Now, what we can do, one way we can try to mitigate that is instead of actually scaling the weights by the number of times two um, features are seen together, what we can do is just say we'll connect them if they're seen together. And you can see that that helps somewhat. It's not quite as um, dramatic a drop off, but that primary eigenvector is still significantly bigger than, than the rest. So we haven't completely fixed the problem. So what we did instead is we introduced what we call a max degree rule. And what the max degree rule says is that any given node can only be connected to at most n other nodes. So for this, in this case, the, the um, maximum was fine. And you can see when we connect this way, um, we get a much flatter um, eigenspectrum and it's possible for different eigenvectors ve uh, to be contributing um, on different trials. So to give you a sense of how this looks as we um, do implement an individual trial, what I've done is taken that original um, example that I showed and I've just stripped out um, any connections that uh, were not connected to either to one of the cues or one of the um, responses. Now to be clear, in the actual model, all of those connections are there. Um, I've just done this for illustrative purposes. 
Now, in this trial, again, we've queued with 3 p.m. Monday, um, week 35. And um, in this case, it, it turns out the correct answer is um, D. Um, you can see after we've propagated that the um, model thinks that um, either D or B are reasonable um, possibilities. And in fact, the participant chose um, option B. And the um, you can kind of see why that might be the case. So if you think about option D here, it's connected to Sunday and to um, happy and to Saturday. So that's probably their home. Um, position B, on the other hand, is connected to Friday and to Monday and to all of the um, weekdays. So uh, week hours, sorry, the middle of the day hours. So, um, so I'm going to speculate that that's the participants' workplace. So you can see that usually on a um, at 3 p.m. on a Monday, the participant would be at location B. Um, it just so happens that on this particular occasion, they were at D. But the model is sensitive to the um, to those contingencies in this particular subject's um, uh, uh, data or experience, um, and therefore is able to capture that when it's um, in terms of the interference structure that it um, postulates. So we fit this model, and the way we fit it was um, rather than, than changing the weights by virtue of the number of times two things were seen together, what we did is we um, fit parameters for the different kinds of weights. So there's a, a um, weights that go between, for instance, the accelerometry nodes and the audio nodes, or the GPS nodes and the time nodes. Um, so we set parameters for each of those, and we um, fit the models um, and used a, a five-fold cross-validation procedure. So 20% of the data was for any given participant was kept out on, um, on any given fold. And we fit the, the um, uh, four-fifths of the data and then tried to predict the, um, the other fifth of the data. Um, when we did that for the uh, first experiment, um, the model matched the participant um, about 55% of the time. And over here on the right, you can see the parameters. So um, GPS and time, that's the direct connection. You can see that that, is, um, that has a, a reasonably strong weight. So that certainly plays a role. Uh, but you can see that other connections in the network are also um, playing an important role in the performance. We look at the fit to the second experiment. So now we have the um, emotion nodes as well in this one. Um, performance is a little bit worse, so we've, um, we're about 52, 53% accurate in um, predicting um, what the participant is going to say. And um, you can see there's a broad range. So again, GPS time, there's a reasonable amount of uh, strength there for that one, but there are plenty of other um, types of connections which show um, significant strength as well. So in conclusion, um, after about a one to three week um, retention interval, people are able to identify where they were about two thirds of the time. The dynamic eigen network model with a max degree learning rule captures about 53% of participant choices. And what the um, model does is it demonstrates a, um, a kind of generalization at retrieval method. So rather than the typical approach that's used these um, uh, in most uh, kind of connectionist um, models where um, one tries to create representations at, at the during the encoding procedure that, that generalize well, What's happening here is we're using a very light connection um, approach at, um, at encoding, and we're relying on gen generalization to occur at retrieval. And well, generally, um, I'm excited about this kind of work because we can see how experience sampling data can now be used to give us um, information about the specific contingencies in a um, given individual's environment, which might be um, uh, determining the nature of the interference that they're um, subject to as they try to uh, make memory decisions. Thanks very much.